we create a community that nurtures and inspires each diverse and passionate voice? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nicole Jansen, and our guest today is Rita First Adams. Rita's passion is building community for the common good and the creative teams that drive that and uh, swing for the fence, social change. She is, uh, she's been working with, uh, with you know, uh, nonprofit organizations, philanthropic organizations, large and small throughout the U.S., internationally over uh, many, many years. And uh, she specifically has been working with causes in education, youth, the arts, community and economic development, historic preservation, healthcare, international relations, and professional and civic affairs. That kind of covers a lot of ground there. So, um, so she's she's awesome. She's got a tremendous amount of experience. She actually taught entrepreneurship for nonprofits for the Masters in Organizational Leadership at Wheelock uh, uh, College. And in addition to her being a regular contributor to board and administrator, she has written and published extensively in the field, including editing the book for the Center of Philanthropy, What Fundraisers Need to Know About State and Federal Regulation, How It Can Influence All Aspects of Their Work. And I took the time to actually go through her bio and share that. There's lots more I could have shared. But the, the reason why I did that was um, because we're going to we're going to touch on some of those things. Mm-hmm. We're going to touch on entrepreneurship. We're going to touch on community building, team building. Perhaps even uh, if we, we have time, we're going to go into uh, setting up a board and all that. So if you have a nonprofit, a philanthropic organization that you uh, want to grow and you want to build in your community, maybe you're launching or you want to, you want to grow something that you have existing, I think this conversation is going to be really valuable. And we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen. So if you're an entrepreneur that listens or a leader that listens, I think that you're going to find that this is very relevant to you as well, because Rita also ties it back and forth from, from the um, entrepreneurship uh, and then the, the for-profit and nonprofit together. So um, stay tuned. We're, we have a great show planned for you. And before I go any further, I do want to say that um, Frank Agan. Uh, give a shout uh-huh. out to Frank. He is the one that connected Rita and I, okay. and this was through a monthly networking group that he has. Uh, Frank's awesome, and he attracts a lot of great yes, people to him. So I recommend connecting with him on LinkedIn. His last name is A G I N, Frank K Agan. So with that, Rita, welcome, Leaders of Transformation. We're glad you're here today. Thank you, Nicole. This is really quite an honor considering some of the guests that you've had. Um, and I think we have a lot in common as far as the way we think about leadership. It is a pleasure to have you. And, uh, you know, we have had a, a lot of wonderful guests on. And when I heard you speak at that, just for the brief few moments that we got an opportunity to share uh, during Frank's networking event there, uh, you shared some things that really piqued my interest. And that's why I wanted you to come and share this with our listeners so that they can benefit from your experience. Now, before we go into it any further, Tell us a little bit more about specifically what you do with these organizations and how you got started in that. Um, Well, with groups, usually they call me in because they want to increase and diversify revenue streams. I mean, that's the bottom line. But as anyone who's been around the block, whether you're talking about startups for uh, charitable organizations or for-profit organizations, you know, that's usually just a symptom of other things going on. Uh, So it's time to really get groups focused on their mission, vision, values, uh, their board development, their messaging to make sure that they're as clear as possible. So that's really where I come in. Um, I've got my little niche as far as why they bring me in, but, you know, this is it. How I got started, uh, you know, my undergraduate degree is in journalism. And I thought, and I got that wonderful job, like so many young people want in an advertising agency, you know, and I was like, mad men, I'm off and running. This is it. We're going, right? And we lost a big client. And so (laughs) those last three young people in the door were the first ones out the door. Um, My boss kept me on as a contractor, which he was somehow able to finagle, but um, everyone in the industry knew him. And when they saw that he was still figuring out how to keep me around, they started calling and I get this call from this woman who starts talking about charities and feasibility studies and case but supports and all this stuff. And I'm thinking there's something wrong with this person. And she sweeps me in on this group and I was hooked because we're working with the chairman of the board. We're working with the leadership. We're working with the CEO 
and we're moving and shaking and getting things done. And these are phenomenal groups. Uh, so I was hooked. I, 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 then I just tried to find every, every, anyone I could find who was doing this kind of work um, and hooked my uh, onto a mentor, which was the only way you got into the business at that point. And he had built the fundraising program at a little university called the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. So awesome. Yeah. I know Ohio. I'm from <laughs> Toronto originally. So I've been to Ohio a lot of times. So, you know, the, the territory. Yes, for sure. For sure. Let's talk about entrepreneurship and nonprofits. Um, you have these, you know, you kind of bring these ideas together. I alluded to it even as yeah. in the introduction. So how do they actually go together and where do they connect or where do they actually d- diverge as well? Well, um, if you want to think about it, love the arts, because I've, I've worked with the arts as well, uh, and actually uh, taught, taught Art New York in terms of uh, did, did programs with them. Uh, they're the membership organization for the 400 plus off and off off Broadway theaters in, in New York City and in all the five boroughs. So they're, so they're a cool organization. But, you know, so the arts forever, forever, right? If you think about any arts program you've ever been to, you're getting sold. You're getting sold tickets. You're getting sold programs. You're getting sold you know, coffee mugs, you name it, you, you know, they're, they're, uh, the arts integrate that earned income quite well, and they've been very good at it. But there's opportunities for all kinds of organizations. If I can, I'm going to use a uh, group that I love dearly, and they're in Massachusetts, um, Boston area, but they're up and down the corridor. So anyone who knows Boston knows Attleboro, Franklin, Northboro, and all these kinds of things. And they're up to now three main facilities in 91 group homes serving children and adults with autism. Now, not exactly the kind of organization that one would look at and say, we're gonna have an earned income stream. However, even with them, when I got started, we solidly got started expanding contributions and building our board and refining our message and being really clear. And they're one group that I'm looking to make sure I read it correctly. I mean, they're all about lifelong learning. So at Amigo, we challenge and encourage each other to grow by providing opportunities for lifelong learning. And it's all about that community of every client, every employee, even if you're frontline, you've just come over from Ghana, guess what? You have a learning plan. That's part of who they are. Because if you're not going forward, you're going backwards as far as they're concerned. So with this group, we, once we got secure to some extent with contributions, we started looking around. It's like, I'm talking to the CEO. Now, these are the things, like what you do for mission, these are the things that you do better than anyone else. How can we make money on them? And so that was part of our, our, our exploration as I worked with the CEO and the chairman of the board. And before the pandemic hit, we had... Uh, rolled a business, uh, merged a business, a for-profit into the not-for-profit because it was doing a training program for the credentials that you have to test for, for part of their industry. They're better at marketing it than the business was. Very good product, but they knew how to get to the right people, how to engage people. They're a trusted resource. They've been known for having the best trained staff in, in the state. So for them to have another level of training program made a lot of sense. It stayed in the black, probably could have been a little bit more robust without a pandemic, but it has stayed in the black and it's provided them a a revenue stream that they otherwise would not have had through all this. Uh, We also started offices in Florida. They're a Massachusetts organization, but what they do in uh, in Massachusetts uh, is highly contracted with the state. And so it's all controlled in Florida. There's opportunities for groups like Amigo and other actually for-profit businesses to offer similar services and get the uh, going rate. And because of that, again, it's provided a a flow of income for the organization that otherwise they would never have had. So two earned income streams for a human service organization that one would never have thought. And what did we do? We looked at what do we do best? What do we know better than anyone else, just like any other business, right? When, when you set up your business, whether it's consulting, whether it's service, whether it's you know, um, the best cupcakes, right? It's what do you do better than anyone else? And that's exactly what we did with them. That's awesome. So we talk about this idea of, I mean, I think it's brilliant that you actually help them to make money 
um, you know, and doing what they do best and actually creating this, this earned income um, so that they're not having to constantly just rely on donations right. and all of that. Now there is a point and I'd love to have you talk about that, this idea of building community and this organic to planned growth, you know, because a lot of these organizations, when they start out, they start out in kind of a, you know, maybe it's yeah. just a passion and they start right. out with a few people that want to do something. And then it's a, there's a point where you've got to go beyond that. And I'm thinking of some in particular, it's like, you got to go beyond that to the infrastructure and the plans and the strategy and all of that. So how do they do that? How do leaders transition? And even maybe talking about like when you have volunteers and now you're going to go to this structure, how that can possibly even disrupt the community and what do they do about that? Right. A lot of good questions. Um, you're right that a lot of organizations and even this one, Amigo, got started by you know a parent uh, standing up to the state and saying, no, I don't think the only opportunity is to place my child in an institution. And so they found a social worker and they got together and they started the organization. So along their lifespan too, they had to figure out, well, what does, what do we look like in five years, 10 years? Now, of course, they had to move to professional staff more swiftly than maybe some other organizations because, you know, this kind of work with, with children and adults with autism is, is highly trained and, and, and people are educated in the, in the arena. Um, but with groups, as far as, you know, they, they get a wonderful idea started. They, they start to have some um, progress. They start to, to feel like they're making uh, a difference in their community, all good. But they do get to that point where the contributions that come in at the beginning to help them out, you know, a lot of close, you know, people very close to it and who I really understand it. But if the organization is going to continue to grow, some of what drives this is income. And so it's a symptom you know, that, that need for increased income is a symptom of what is happening with programs. And so for them to really capture more people's attention and for the community to really embrace them, they need to start letting the community know more about why uh, they should give to this organization or be involved with this organization versus another and what difference is it gonna make for the community. I mean, there was um, the first historian for uh, philanthropy in the United States referred to charity and philanthropy. And I always liked that concept because charity, he talks about, is the soup kitchen. You know, we feed people, we're a compassionate nation, we don't want anyone to go to bed hungry. But philanthropy sits back and looks at that and says, why do we have people lined up waiting for a meal? What's going on in my community that is causing this? And shouldn't we be? addressing this issue versus just feeding someone today. That's a you know, great distinction. I've never heard that. I like it. Yeah. It's good. And I think it's, it's you know, I came, Dr. Robert Brebner, a historian, came up with this. And that, that was his example. It's just, you can picture it. You can feel it. Um, a good one I've got going right now is a community in, in California serving a lot of the farm workers but also other people in the community. And what they've been known for is through all this is they've kept people fed. They've worked to keep people rents paid, keep people housed so that they don't end up on the street. Great work. However, what they're really pushing towards now, going from organic, right? Organic is let's keep people housed because we know what happens that if the moment you lose that house, even if it's a rental apartment, it's harder to get you back in than if we, you know, it just, it, just, it just makes everything more difficult. So that's a good part of what they do. However, now they're looking to, and this is the organic to plan growth. They've been, we've had great discussions with the board and the staff. How do we push it more towards our work of not just keeping them fed and housed, but how do we help them as families, each family unit grow and make it life better for each child that they've brought here? So that's what they're about now is that part now is that transition to doing more collaborative work with other agencies so that when they work with a family, um, they work to bring every tool that the community has available to them 
to the table to get children uh, scholarships or to even keep them in high school in the first place, to help them graduate, to help them do their taxes so they get their tax return sooner. I mean, these may sound ridiculous things, but when you're uh, part of an immigrant population in the United States, they can be insurmountable on your own. But together as a community, now we're helping you making sure that you have your green card. And if you want to go for citizenship, what are the tools available in the community and matching you up? So that they're now working towards making every, you know, working on every member of their, co their community being part of the prosperous part of their community. And it helps everyone because it's neighbors helping neighbors and the people who come to the table and make this happen, uh, the wonderful volunteers and the board members all feel like this is their role in making sure that their community is wholesome and helping each other and that we all yeah. grow together. So again, yeah. you know, it's, it's this balance of the universe, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> in terms of, of how everyone benefits from this. Yeah. It's interesting, I'm, I'm hearing a theme here. We're gonna go into board members and how to establish a, a, an effective board in a moment. But it's interesting there this theme because last week we had Ron Carr on the show. Actually, in a few weeks ago we had Sarah Disick, uh, who she actually started in nonprofit and wanted to make an impact in the world, and then realized, hey, you know what? And if I really want to make an impact, I need to do it in business. And so she mm -hmm. got into business and she actually developed a company called um, uh, uh, what is it Under Canvas, and it's a glamping company, and then ended up selling it for hundred million dollars, and now has a a venture capital fund where she's uh -huh. helping women lend businesses to be able to get funded and all that stuff. So that's Sarah. And I just seeing that progression of what you're talking right. about here, it's like, well, that's great, but you know, this needs to be sustainable to do it. Right. The other thing was uh, Ron Carr, who I had on last week, he talked about velocity mindset and he was talking mm -hmm. about our focus, what we focus on asking different questions, turning your reality, your vision, excuse yeah. me, into reality. And it, I'm hearing the same thing here. These are success principles that yeah. work. And so you're helping them to expand their vision from just helping someone, giving them a handout right. to giving them a handout. And what you're talking about is building that community where the whole community is actually getting together to be involved in this. And then you're talking about sustainability with that is because something that everybody's involved in is much more likely to be sustainable. And so I, I just I just wanted to comment and and for those of our listeners who are actually following every episode, you just start to see this consistency and talking about it in different arenas right. and how these principles apply. And that's what the, the interesting thing about success principles is that they apply yes. all the time and they work all the time. So really, really powerful. Now let's talk about board. And uh, as you go from organic growth to planned growth, somewhere along the way, you know, I yeah. know uh, friends of mine that have started nonprofits and and discovered that their board really wasn't very active. They're like, sure, I'll be on your board. And yeah. that's about the last they saw them. <laughs> and then there's, which I'm sure you've seen that too. And then there's a point where they were like, okay, well, we we need to create a board and I'm not even sure who we need on our board. I don't know what kind of yeah. skills we need on our board. How does it look? How do we even mm -hmm. get our board on the yeah. same page? What does it look like to even manage a board? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that, that yeah. aspect of it? And I love what you said about the basics, because you know what? A lot of this comes back to the basics, mission, vision, values. And what, that's one of the first things that we clarify and to make sure that it still resonates or that we tweak it and update it to make sure that it, this is really who we are and what we're doing and where we're going, because that is just so important to driving every decision that we make. It helps us start to focus all of our resources. And the other thing is it does help us attract the kind of talent that we need, both when we hire and also when we do continue to develop our board of trustees. When I have anything to do with it, I like to use the word trustee because when you, when you think about it, you, board of directors, you can use for for-profit or not-for-profit. Trustee, you, you may only use for a not-for-profit. So when I see that, I know who you are, beyond a shadow of a doubt. The other thing is it reminds everyone there that I'm holding this organization in trust for the public good. So when I walk in that door, I have to be thinking about the greater good. And 
sometimes that means setting aside some of my own personal needs. I've worked with the International Foundation of Tai Chi Chuan. They made a decision. They would have these raucous decision, discussions. And I mean, I'm sitting in the corner of the room because these people are like, you know, in addition to this, you know, they're karate specialists and all kinds of things. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. But when they made a decision, it was like an amoeba and they just moved as one. It was the greatest thing ever. And it was their chairman who said, you know, you really helped us all think through that when we make decisions, that is for the betterment of the whole and to hold aside, you know, some of our own personal needs for the greater good. So that's one thing with the board is to have a mindset with the people that you bring on that why are they there and what are they looking to accomplish? And hopefully it's that buy-in to the organization's mission, vision, and values. The other thing is that you mentioned that's I think really strategic for organizations and they need to be strategic about is exactly that. What talents do we need? I mean, people think that, you know, well, I know Nicole from such and such and yes, she's talented, but is she talented in ways that are beneficial for where the organization is right now? I mean, I actually have groups we list. What do we really need at the table for some of our discussions? about the organization and when we're making decisions and advising the staff and the CEO, do I need an attorney at the table? Do I need somebody who's really good in finance? Do I need somebody who knows investments? Do I need somebody who knows state government? Um, and for every organization, this is gonna be slightly different. Um, you may want a political, somebody who's politically savvy, but not necessarily political, you know, politician. You may want somebody, um, you know, some people have, uh, for the social work organizations, they will actually have somebody with a gazillion years of experience because that sometimes helps them in discussions that they're having with, uh, as far as issues with, with uh, programs. So they may have somebody really knowledgeable about programs as well. Um, with international organizations, we may have people who've done international marketing, international law, other things like that. So really think through the kinds of talents, just like any, for-profit board does, right? When they're selecting a new director, they may be lacking somebody who um, uh, has experience in marketing or social media that they feel like they really want that voice at the table. The commitment to mission, vision, values, of course, is you know goes with all of this. You know, it has to be. And the other thing I would tell groups is to look beyond themselves. And like I look, I come into groups and I'm like, you know, you're a really great looking group of people. And if we keep looking for new board members the way you've been doing it, i.e. the same little circles that all of you run into, you're gonna to continue to look like this. And that might not be the best thing for the organization. So again, what is it that you need in terms of geography, diversity? Uh, what, you know, uh, with international organizations, it may need me the representation from a different country than you have on, the, on that table. How are you going to get there? It's not always that you are bringing somebody in from another group, you know, specifically for that purpose. It's more that um, with community, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, community development organizations have been really good over the years because their board you know, actually has to be, you know, a certain part of the community and how this relates. But with that, um, you can reach out to like, you know, will faith-based organizations provide you access or knowledge of people who you otherwise would not run into because they don't go to the same country club you do, or they don't go to the same temple you do. So as you're looking to expand your board or even change it over, I always look to people and say, what are the talents we really need? What are the areas they need to come from? What are you lacking in other ways? And how do we strategically find people who will meet a lot of these criteria and bring new voices to the table. Um, I don't know if you're going to get into it, but I'd like to also talk a little bit about how do we make sure that these voices can be heard. Yeah. And, and that's actually perfect because that's kind of the next step in this is, okay, so now you have these people. Yeah. So how do you actually work with them? And I know from speaking to certain um, people that have had challenging experiences with boards that sometimes they don't do enough and other times they feel that they have 
more say they feel that they should have more say than they than they actually should so can you kind of talk about that balance you know it's like you're not running the show and you know so yeah talk a little bit about that right right and, and that's a good that's a really good uh, uh comment they're not running the show you know they are here for their insights their experience their advice their connections uh, a host of things that that people can bring to the table. Uh, it's everything from looking at budgets and saying, you know, from my experience, I've seen this and this happen. Can we discuss or may I raise a question about this? Um, they're not actually formulating it or running it. And, you know, at the end of the week, finally, a good board is just like a business, right? You're hiring and firing that CEO. And then after that, um, you know, you, that person, that CEO that you've, you've hired, hires and fires everyone else in the organization. And, you know, if you think about it, about it, that's one thing in terms of for-profit and not-for-profit that we have in common is that reliance on that CEO and that relationship of the CEO with the board. So I think from that standpoint, that's a good analogy for most or people because they have some business experience oftentimes when they come to the table. And if they think about it from their company standpoint, that that's exactly what would be happening because it, I think it happens more often probably in uh, philanthropic organizations that people want to get involved in. Well, but I know Susie, you can't fire Susie, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like any other organization. Finally, um, you have to make the decisions that are best for the team. And sometimes even a longtime employee um, ha has, has finished their, their potential at an organization. So with board members, I think it's the same thing that, that they have to understand that they're more for that strategic long-term planning and opportunities. They're there to work their connections and uh, maybe bring in new talent. That can be anything from hopefully a new board member. It could be a new funding source. Um, a lot of our work really needs to be more collaborative and looking to even mergers and acquisitions. And a lot of that comes from our board members because they really do, should understand the communities that we're working in. And they should be able to help us keep our eyes open for ways that we can expand our work. I think you know, the days of working in silos, which I think too many organizations have done, are way over. And the more yeah. that we really reach out and find organizations doing similar things and ways to work together, then we all benefit. And especially the people we serve benefit. So I think that's another thing for our board members is to have that vision and that voice and to be thinking ahead because too often our staff does get overwhelmed with the day-to-day. -day. And so board members should be out there looking at what the horizon is. They should be looking at other organizations. They should be seeing how other groups are doing things um, and bringing potential to the table. Yeah, and not getting caught in the minutia either. So just like on the flip right. side, if they get caught in the day-to-day -day and thinking that they're actually running the show and being involved in every right. little thing, then they no longer have the same ability to see things from the bigger picture. So that's really, really important. Now you mentioned about uh, making sure that everyone has a voice. Uh, yeah. Are there practical things that you would recommend people do to say, okay, well, I have this board. I think everybody has a voice. I don't know. How do I make sure that I'm actually giving everybody a voice? Yeah, it's the most, it's, it's sort of, sometimes it's easy to talk about these things, but it's harder to, you know, when, when we're having those meetings, right? How do you really make sure that we're listening and exploring new ideas, no matter where they come from? And that's the challenge is that I think for, um, I mean, I was raised with a tradition in terms of this, this uh, arena from the uh, early Big Ten people. And then also um, Miss Elaine Black was one of those women who was at the table. You know, we, we, we think we were the only woman at the table at times. She really was. Um, and she, uh, you know, if you remember the stories about women painting and the, the line up the back of their leg to make it look like they were, she was there, okay, she's now passed away. But that was the biggest thing that she instructed me early on was that we have a unique voice. And when we come to the table, the only way we're really serving the organizations, our community is when we are 
bringing that unique voice to the table and how important that is. Uh, so that's why she laughed when women were trying to look like little men with the big bows and the suits and things like that. She said, it doesn't work. Uh, we're, you know, we're so way past that. But with building teams over the years, um, I've had the opportunity where we've had different age groups, where we've had people with different backgrounds, where, and it comes out of a lot of the community economic development work, where when you're coming together and working on a common goal, that it allows you to really focus on that. And then along the way, you get to learn about what you have in common and what the strengths of your differences are. And why all together now you're this wonderful group, like this together that I have in the background here um, is Milton Glaser. Uh, he was a graphic designer who did I Love New York. And he placed that into the universe. And this is the last thing that he placed into the universe for all of us to use. And he said, um, I don't know if there's a collective consciousness, but if we realize we're all related and we need one another, that would be the best thing that could happen. And so this is all different typefaces, all touching each other so that if one moves, everything falls and that it only works if we're working together. So I've had groups where we've had, you know, the graduate student and the chair of the philosophy department at the same table, light years in terms of, of, of experiences, in terms of cultures, in terms of everything else. But if we can make it so that when the graduate student says, what about this? And we look and stop for a second and say, uh, okay, where would that take us? And the chairman says, okay, if we try it this way. And so between the two, we've got the nugget. And then we have the, the, the person with the experience who takes it home and takes it, figures out how to take that nugget of an idea and turn it into something that was actually valuable for the organization. And, and in this case, it ended up grading state laws on shared parenting across the United States because of one nugget of an idea from a graduate student and the uh, insights of a chairman of the board. Wow. So it's how do we structure our meetings from the you know, very beginning so that we're as welcoming as possible. And that does mean that, you know, as we bring diverse groups and cultures and everything else to the table, like community academic development has done over the years, let's make sure we have some common goals that we're working on because in doing that, then we start to recognize, you know, the strengths and, uh, of what everyone brings to the table and that we're, you know, in, in most cases, we want the same things. And I think that breaks down so many barriers for us and helps us get the discussions going. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think about the openness of a CEO to listen to somebody who's a grad student to say, hmm, let's explore that. And it's that, it's that creativity. It's that openness to say, I don't know everything. Again, another theme through the guests that I've had on this show. I don't know everything. If I try to think that I, if I put myself, there's a lot of pressure to think that I need to know and have all the yeah. answers because I'm the CEO <laughs> and it's limits. It limits mm -hmm. innovation. It limits the creative yeah. uh, process and, uh, and also the learning growth to, to, to be able to determine which ideas, because everybody in the room is now learning how some ideas mm -hmm. are right. you know, really good ideas and some ideas may not be so good ideas and how you process that so that everything's a learning experience. So that's really, really great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rita. I really appreciate you being here. I know time flies um, oh my gosh, and this... there's so much more that we could share. I know you have an, an opportunity to, uh, you said you have a free gift that you want, you want to give our listeners, or maybe that's the next step for people if they want more information. That'd be great. Yes, um, I'm, I'd like people to reach out to me. Uh, we can arrange one lively hour of discussion with your uh, board of trustees, or could be maybe another group of volunteers that are working with you. And I'll be happy to facilitate the discussion on the topic of your choice. So just, should awesome. I just give people my email address? Is that the easiest thing? Yeah, let's do that. So it's Rita, R-I-T-A, at Rita, R-I-T-A, and then I spell first with my email, 1st.com. So Rita at RitaFirst.com. Beautiful. Rita, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for what you're doing because you're helping organizations to go to planned 
growth and to be able to make greater impact. And so some of the things that we get to experience in our communities are a result. You're kind of like the the person behind the scenes, helping to move the pieces into place so that we get to experience the benefit on the other side. So I I really do appreciate you uh, doing that. And I know you don't do a lot of podcasts. I, my understanding is so, you know, for you to be able to share this here is just super, super value. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we'll make sure all the links are in the show notes uh, so that, that our listeners can connect with you. Rita first, which is Rita, the number one st.com is the website. We'll make sure LinkedIn and all those thank different you. social platforms are going to be there as well. And thank you to our listeners for, for being here. You know, I believe that leaders mm-hmm. of transformation take action. So you can listen to podcasts, you can absorb all this wonderful information, but it's when you look at how you could apply it to your own situation that transformation happens. And so I would encourage you to consider some of the things that Rita has so uh, eloquently shared. And some of these things are um, applicable, you know, in the for-profit, some are applicable, you know, of course, just more uh, focused on the nonprofit, but there are principles that work here. And so I would encourage you to challenge yourself and saying, how can we apply that in our organization? How can I apply that in my, me, my own one person wanting to make a difference idea. And so that you can start to make the impact that you're capable of making. We'd love to hear your stories. You can go on leaders of transformation.com and reach out to us there. And we'd love to hear what you're up to. You can also of course, find us and follow us on social. Uh, We're all over social media. And uh, if you like this episode, please share it with a friend, somebody else who has a nonprofit who, um, you know, in particular, who might be uh, drowning in all of the pieces and not figuring out how it all works together, send this to them so that they can be encouraged and that they can schedule a time with Rita to have a conversation on the topic of their choice to be able to move things forward for them. So, and you can make a difference by helping another person make a difference. So I encourage you that again, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of the Leaders of Transformation.